Join Charles and Hillary Price for Faith, Hope, and Love, the story of a man who responded to God's call to transform the lives of street children across Kenya. I'm here in Delani, about 100 kilometers from the capital city of Nairobi. In this semi-arid part of Kenya, it might not seem that much can grow, and yet it has become a place of both physical and spiritual transformation. Mali Mountain is the nickname for this mountain behind me. It's named after Charles Mully. Over the next three weeks, we'll be learning about this man of God. He literally sold everything he had to rescue children from a life of poverty and despair on the streets. The Mully Children's Family is the organization he founded in 1989. Today, there are over 10,000 children who have been rescued and rehabilitated through MCF. Living Truth is here in Kenya to bring you three special programs about this wonderful work. My wife, Hillary, is traveling with me, and she will be sharing insights with us along the way as we hear stories of transformed lives. Faith, hope, and love in the most unlikely places. Mali Children's Family has its largest residential home in Delani. Here, over 600 street children, plus other orphaned and vulnerable children, are being cared for. MCF has six locations spread across Kenya, and the vision is all-encompassing. Young lives are truly being turned around, just as Charles Mully saw his own life turned around. It's the Friday morning assembly at the Mali Children's Family Home at Dalani. Over 600 children are eager to hear from the man they all call Daddy, Daddy Mali. He gives a brief pep talk before they all disperse to their classrooms. They performed so well that we led in the whole of our sub-county of Jata. Charles Mali is the founder of this large organization, known by its initials MCF. He's a busy man running six locations from Mombasa to Eldoret to Dalani. But he's always got time for personal contact with the young people who are now part of his family. We use the power of the Holy Spirit, and with that power, then we can move on. He has got a deep affinity for abandoned, homeless, and orphaned children because he was once one of them. My early life was faced with a lot of uh, difficulties, and as a homeless child, I learned begging, asking people to help, and so living a very desperate life. Charles woke in his hut one morning to find himself alone. He had been abandoned by his abusive and impoverished family at the age of six. The life was miserable. I wanted to take away my life because there was nothing, because I had nothing, you know, within my life. By age 16, Charles was sick, uneducated, unloved, and without hope. I never saw ending of extreme poverty and hopelessness. So at that state and that situation is when I felt like I was no worthy 
of living. So why didn't you take your life? Why didn't you commit suicide? What stopped you? Another young man saw me so desperate. And then he invited me to church youth rally where there were young people. So the preacher spoke about the forgiveness of our sin and that topic gave me a real new life. And then I surrendered myself and I said, Lord, Jesus, come into my heart. And I gave my life to Jesus Christ. From that time, my life completely changed. As a Christian, Charles wanted a better life. He walked for three days to get to Kenya's capital city, Nairobi. He got a job as a gardener. That first work progressed to an office job. Charles Mully saved his money and bought a used car. He started a business driving his car as a taxi, a matatu. I enjoyed driving it, and then I was able to buy another car, and then I bought a fleet of buses, each bus 62 passengers, and so my, um, my business grew. So you built up a lot of money by now. <laughs> yes. It was a rags to riches, real life story. Over the years, he became a millionaire with large oil and tire distribution businesses and an insurance company. But then another life change came that was even more dramatic. He had God telling him to give up all his hard earned wealth and care for street children. When I saw children crying, when I saw children in the street, when I saw street mothers, everybody. I saw myself in their, um, their, their faces. So that's how I became a father to the fatherless, because the Lord God was speaking to me, and I felt there was nothing else that I could do. And even when I tried to resist, there was pressure, pressure, a lot of pressure in my heart. And the following day, I went to the street, and then I started the ministry of the Muli children's family. Caring, feeding, educating, clothing, and they caring with them with the love that of a real father to them. And my wife is the mother of all the children. Charles sold all his businesses to fund the work. 25 years later, over 10,000 children have benefited from programs run by the Mali Children's Family across Kenya. Praise God. And a song, Araka. We are Masalujasu. When you tell us that I'm going to go to Oikosi Amankos. When you tell us that I'm going to go to Oikosi Amankos. The key components at the Mali Children's Family are spiritual growth and education. A high school is already in operation. Charles Mully's latest vision is to build a university. Africa needs people who are free from corruption. Young people and the future generation, that would really touch the heart of the people and how to be there for others, as even the Lord Jesus Christ was there 100% for every need person and for every child who was dying. So that is really my appeal for prayers, so that this dream about the philosophy will come to become true and become accomplished. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to Jesus. Amen. Amen. You were watching Faith, Hope, and Love, Living Truth in Kenya. This is Kibera Slum in Nairobi, the largest urban slum in the whole of Africa. Here home is a shack around 12 feet square with a corrugated iron roof, mud walls, and a dirt floor. Perhaps eight people live in any one of these shacks. Clean water is scarce. Children are unlikely to go to school, and life can be dangerous. 
Toilets are an open sewer or a pit latrine shared by up to 50 shacks. When it's full, boys are paid to carry the contents and dump them in the heavily polluted river. From early in the morning, many men are drunk on Changa, a local illegal brew. Combine that with an unemployment rate of about 50%, and you have a breeding ground for huge social problems. Here, women are especially at risk to violence or rape. At any one time, half the girls aged between 16 and 25 are pregnant. We can show you pictures of these conditions, but what we cannot convey to you is the smell. It is overpowering and sickening. It gets in your clothes, in your hair, in your nostrils. It's hard to live within it. Today, Charles Mully is here in Kibera to follow up on a child in trouble. From a hill overlooking Kibera, the slum stretches almost as far as the eye can see. Charles and Esther Mali are on a mission. They've got a report about a family in a desperate situation. The goal today is to find the family in the myriad of narrow alleyways to see if MCF can help. Mostly, take care, yeah? take care. Uh, mostly is people are left alone to survive to make their own arrangement. The government provides no services in Kibera slum, no health care, no sanitation, no water. School higher than elementary has compulsory fees. Finding the way to the family in need is not easy. There are no addresses. Deep into the slum, a message is sent ahead. Foreigners are coming with Daddy Mali. The family is waiting in their one-room shack. Mary, a 35-year-old mother, is a widow. So, ni mimi naitwa mnaitwa jina langu naitwa Baba Mole ama Daddy Mole. Mimi ni baba ya watoto wengi sana. Karibu 1000. Mary was only 13 when she had her first daughter. Now she has five children plus a grandchild. My husband died of HIV, meaning I'm HIV positive. My last born is as well positive. I contracted it before giving birth to her. Mary's husband died 10 years ago. Since then, she has struggled to take care of her children while fighting AIDS herself. For these children, I get out to look for some laundry work in people's homes. If I don't get any, I'll just go back home and we will sleep hungry. This very morning, Mary's situation became even worse. This room is so tiny and it's not secure for all of us to sleep in it. I normally beg my neighbor to allow some of my children to sleep in their houses. Today, I was woken up with a notice of eviction for not paying the rent. The rent for this one room is 2,000 Kenyan shillings a month, about $25. But there's no money to pay it. Sometimes they sleep without food. It's hard when the children are around and they cannot have a meal then they feel like, wow, what can we do? What about tomorrow? So that is what she's trying to explain. All the children have been thrown out of school because Mary has an outstanding debt of 10,000 shillings for school fees. My request is if you can assist me to have one child get education. Education is highly valuable. I did not get education myself, but I would wish to see them educated, to take charge of their lives or even help me in my future. The choice is agonizing for Mary. She doesn't want any of her children away from her, but she wants to give at least one an opportunity. She selects her youngest son, Otieno. And if he could be helped and uh, be given education, and of course, you know, food, clothing, and everything, and then uh, Christian values and so forth, she felt that the boy also could be able to help them in the future. I am led by the Spirit of God, having evaluated their problem, 
and uh, seeing the state of uh, the poverty and the need. Now I make a decision to to take this boy and then we'll Dr. See Mali him. checks with 12-year-old Otieno if he wants to come to live at MCF. Yeah, it's a great joy and would like to go with me. It takes Otieno just a few minutes to pack up his meager belongings. Then he's ready to start his new life. You lift us from poverty. You see the life you're in? We want to move out of here. Work hard and get the education. You meet some other kids there too. We will come to visit you there. Seventy kilometers from Nairobi and a world away from the Kibera slum, Otieno is introduced to children his own age from grade eight. And now I'm happy to present him to you. What do you say? Welcome, all right. The boys take him to the dormitory to show him where he will sleep. Dr. Mali and Charles check in later to see how he is doing. So, Tiano, how did you feel when all those boys who are going to be your friends, they surrounded you, they greeted you, they brought you here to this room? Mm -hmm. The next big adjustment is school. The MCF school is right on site. Otieno is assessed to see what level he's at. Then he's integrated into the classroom and he doesn't have to worry he'll be thrown out for lack of school fees. A few days later, Charles catches up with Otieno at lunchtime. He prays with him and pledges to keep praying even after he's left Kenya. So thank you we could meet together. In Jesus' name, amen. In the years ahead, Otieno okay. will learn how to now be honest, how to share resources at MCF, and how to love God and others. He now has the opportunity for a better life so he can return to help his family. At the Mully Children's Family Church service this week, Charles Price is the special guest speaker. The scripture reading he has chosen is from 1 Samuel, chapter 17, verses 3 to 11. The Philistine army was camped on one hill. Israel's army was on another. The valley was between them. A mighty hero named Goliath came out of the Philistine camp. He was from Gath. He was more than nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head. He wore bronze armor that weighed 125 pounds. On his legs, he wore bronze guards. He carried a bronze javelin on his back. His spear was as big as a weaver's rod. Its iron point weighed 15 pounds. The man who carried his shield walked along in front of him. Goliath stood there and shouted to the soldiers of Israel. He said, why do you come out and line up for battle? I'm a Philistine. You are servants of Saul. Choose one of your men, 
have him come down and face me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we'll become your slaves. But if I win and kill him, you will become our slaves and serve us. Goliath continued, This day I dare the soldiers of Israel to send a man down to fight against me. Saul and the whole army of Israel heard what the Philistines said. They were terrified. For this special service, school students and villagers from the surrounding area are invited. It's an overflow crowd, eager to hear the teaching. Amen. Thank you. Do you know how to kill a giant? We read about Goliath, nine feet tall. He had a big bronze helmet on his head. He was wearing heavy armor that weighed 125 pounds. He had a javelin strapped onto his back. He had a spear with an iron point on that weighed 15 pounds. He had a shield so big, somebody else carried it for him. He was an adult man. He'd been a soldier for many years. He was the champion of the Philistine. And then there was David. David was a boy. The age of many of you here, he had no armor. He had no helmet, no javelin, no spear, no shield. He was dressed as a shepherd boy would be dressed, just a shirt and his short. And he had a sling, and he had five stones in his pocket. And this giant Goliath was met by this boy, David. And you know that David won the battle. And it tells us why. Because in the verses we had read, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head, and the whole world will know there's a God in Israel. This is a well-known story. And it's not just in the Bible to be a nice story to read and talk about. All of us are fighting battles. We have temptations. We have our fears. We bring things from our past. In the night, we have dreams that wake us up, and they're nightmares. We often feel crushed by them. But David had a secret. And it's a secret that you can have, that I can have. The big secret is that it was God who gave him the victory. But there's more than just that. When David came to the battlefield to bring some bread and some barley for his brothers, his father had told him to leave the sheep with the shepherd and to take this food for them. His brothers were all soldiers. And when David arrived, there was no fighting. What's the problem? Is it a holiday? No, they said, we have a problem. You see on the Philistine army over there, there's one man who is very big. And that giant has made a challenge to us. Let's have one person from your army fight one person from our army, and the winner is the winner of the war. Well, that was a very interesting way to fight a battle. And the Israelites thought about it. Their king was Saul. And King Saul said, we will do it. And Goliath said, I'm fighting for the Philistines. Who is going to fight for you? And there was nobody. Somebody volunteer. He said, if somebody fights Goliath, they can have my daughter as a wife. But nobody responded. If somebody fights, their family can be free of packs for the rest of their life. Nobody would respond. If somebody will fight, I will give him great money. And nobody was responding. And now David came to bring food for his brothers. So why isn't somebody standing up and fighting Goliath? They said, because he's a b -b 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 big. He's a g -g -g giant. We are f -f frightened. We could never beat him. David said to his brothers, isn't God the God of Israel? Oh, David, don't be so silly. That doesn't help us in our battles. And they told him to go home to look after his sheep. He went down to meet King Saul. He said, King Saul, why is nobody fighting the giant Goliath? Well, David, he's too big. I have heard that since I've been here. That's all I hear. If nobody else will go, I will go. But you're only a boy. You've never fought a battle like this in your life. You cannot do it. 
And I want to read you what David said. In verse 34 of 1 Samuel 17, David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock. I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, I struck it, I killed it, and your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistines. Charles Price continues his message later in this program. Coming up now, a vision for the future, the Mully International University. At the Mully Children's Family Site at Yetta, about 70 kilometers from Nairobi, there is already a vocational college. The plan is to expand it to be a fully accredited university. Dr. Mully takes Charles to explore the 500-acre site, already owned by MCF. What is your big vision? I know you want to influence very widely. What is your big vision? My big vision is to make the future generation really learn how to become self-sufficient, self-reliant. I want to have an institution where people will get the very best of the best courses, especially community development and environmental development. My philosophy mostly is helping others be concerned about the climate change, water conservation, about the mission, reaching out to people who are hearted. And some of these courses are not being covered elsewhere, water management, uh, ecological issues, is that right? Yes, uh, most of these courses are not offered within our country, but I would like to bring up these courses to discover, yes, we can feed ourselves the best practice in agriculture, clean water, which will prolong the life of people, and they can do also better in their um, life endeavors. That seems to me to be quite a unique feature, that part of your curriculum is ethical as well as academic, that you want people to be giving back into society with compassion, with generosity, not feathering their own nest first. Yeah, the life we live today, it's everything for myself. And we need an equal share in our society. And that's what Muli International University would really like to offer and make the young people who be energetic, motivated to work, motivated to think, innovation, creativity, and again, about loving God. Loving God, you love people. Loving people, then you love God. That's one goes together. The vision is to establish the Mali International University. It is a bold and exciting plan. For over 25 years, MCF has been rescuing street children, loving, nurturing, and training them so they can have a future. However, this is only treating the symptoms of what is wrong in Kenyan society. The problems of breakdown of the family, alcoholism, corruption, tribal tensions, and lack of opportunity perpetrate this cycle of poverty. Charles Muller's long-term and more ambitious dream is to change Kenyan society itself. In the future, Charles Mully sees fathers who will not abandon their children, mothers who will be educated, accountants who will be honest, politicians who will want the best for their country rather than lining their own pockets, and doctors who will not shy away from treating the poor. Already there are graduates from the MCF High School who are qualified to go to university but they don't have the funds to attend. This is a big, God-given dream, to create an opportunity for college and university education that otherwise will not be available to these young people. Living Truth is giving you the opportunity to participate in this dream to make it a reality. We welcome your gifts, donations, and your prayers from Mully International University.
The proposed Mully International University will be an expansion of the vocational college already in operation. The project has land, a developed curriculum, and an international team of academic advisors. Living True's goal is to raise $750,000 for classrooms and laboratories. Today, you can invest in the Christian education of future African leaders. Put faith, hope, and love into action by sending a check to Living Truth, P.O. Box 91100, Bayview Village, Toronto, Ontario, M2K 2Y6, or call 1-888-269-6085 to donate with a credit card. On the internet, go to livingtruth.ca to make a secure donation. Living Truth is a registered charity and donations are tax deductible. And one of the main reasons that many of dictators in Africa have always, always blocked education, building of schools, even when you hear about the Boko Haram, uh, the terrorist group, what they do, even the Al-Shabaab, they, they, they go, they destroy the classrooms, they kill all the pupils, why? Because if they are educated, they cannot be radicalized and that's what they are afraid of. So Muli International University is set to, to change the dynamics of so many things in Kenya and Africa at large. Charles is telling the well-loved story of David and Goliath. David has just volunteered to fight Goliath. But King Saul tells him, you are only a boy. You cannot do it. David has his answer ready. So one day I was out in the field with my father's sheep. Suddenly, out of the bush came a lion. Now, I think if I was David, I would have run away and gone home and said, there's a lion that's come amongst the sheep. But David was a good shepherd. And he knew if he was a good shepherd, he had to protect his sheep. The lion got hold of his sheep and lifted it up in its mouth. David ran to the lion, struck it, took the sheep from the lion's mouth. The lion turned to attack David. He took it by the beard. I think it was a male lion. Maybe he had a club in his hand, maybe a spear, I don't know. But he killed the lion. He said, King Saul, out in the field all alone, God gave me victory over a lion. And then a bear came. I think there aren't any bears in Africa. We have bears in Canada, and bears are dangerous. And after the lion had gone, a bear came, and the bears stole a sheep. And I ran after it as fast as I could. And I said, God, help me rescue this sheep. And I struck it, and I killed it. And I kept my sheep safe. God delivered me from the lion, and God delivered me from the bear. I'm not telling you this because I'm a strong warrior. No, I'm a little shepherd boy. I go outside with the sheep. <laughs> I smell like a sheep. But he said, the Lord delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, and he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. I have experienced God out in the fields. Nobody is watching. No one's saying, David, well done. And I said, God, this lion is bigger than me. This bear is stronger than me. But I am going to be a good shepherd. You want me to be a good shepherd. You help me to deliver the sheep from the lion and the bear. And he said, God delivered me. And therefore, alone in the field, in private, he had begun to experience God in such a way that now he knows he can trust God in public against the giant. He could have run away from the lion and the bear. I'm sure his father said, David, if ever a lion comes, don't you try to fight the lion. You just get home as fast as you can. But David knew that he knew God. That's not just a belief in your mind. That is to become an experience in your life. And David proved God by attacking the lion in God's strength. I'm sure David prayed very quickly. God, I can't do this myself. The lion will kill me. The bear will kill me. You will give me the strength. You will give me the power. And therefore, King Saul, I will go to fight this giant because I know that God can deliver because he already has. 
Now, there are two things that are taking place in David, and these two things take place in you, and they take place in me. David had an inside, and he had an outside. The inside is in his mind, his heart, his soul. The outside is how he lives outside of his own self in the world. You have an inside and an outside too. What happens in the outside of your life is because of what is happening in the inside of your life. Inside, David is trusting God. David is loving God. He is asking God to enable him and strengthen him. If you read some of the Psalms written by David, you'll see how much David knew God on the inside of his life. And what happened on the inside of his life could then come out in the outside and see the victory that God gave him. David didn't pray like this. Oh God, the line is too big. Please send a lightning bolt, a thunderstorm and lightning, and boom! Please make a trap in the ground that the line will fall into. Please cause an elephant to sit on him. No, he didn't say change all those things. You've changed me. And it's what's happening inside me, not out there, that will change the situation. And on the outside, he could experience, he knew the presence of God. He still had to go and fight him on the outside. But his power was not in his muscles, though he had them. But his power was God in his life. Stay tuned for the conclusion of this message later in the program. Coming up now, a story of hope. According to a report by Kenya's National Commission on Human Rights in 2006, a girl or woman in Kenya is raped every 30 minutes. Many assaults, however, will never be reported due to the stigma and fear. It is a silent epidemic. There is little justice even when the perpetrators are caught. The culture says that girls are to remain sexually pure until marriage. When they are raped, they are treated as impure. Parents will shame and reject them, as does the community at large. Let me introduce you to Levine, who knows this stigma all too well. They're called child mothers, children giving birth to children. At the Mali Children's Family Home at Delani, they are taught how to care for their babies while receiving care themselves. Lavine is 16 years old. She was pregnant at 15. When her trauma began, she was just 10. And then something terrible happened with your father, I think, didn't it? Yeah. Can you talk to me a little about that? Um, my father sexually molested me when I was in grade six. He started coming towards me and he took out a knife. He was unzipping and he was removing his briefs. So I was wondering what's happening. He pushed me to the bed and he told me if I loved my mother and if I loved my family, if I wanted to keep my family together. I wouldn't tell anyone anything about it. Okay. I never lived with a man. It was painful. Kept asking him why. He just kept answering me. It's your mother's fault. It's your mother's fault. She didn't give me a son. Her mother found out about the rape, but never reported it to police. It led to the breakup of the marriage. Lavine was expected to carry on with life as though nothing had happened. Five years later, she was beginning to heal when her troubles got a lot worse. It started with an argument with her mother, who blamed her for the split in the family. Then she was like, get out. Every time I see you, I feel bad. Just go out. You know what, Lavine, it's time you just disappeared from my life. I felt rejected and I just couldn't take it. I couldn't stay there. It was night time. 15-year-old Lavine left the house and just a few kilometers down the road was stopped by some drunken boys. 
one began to touch her. When I was angry, I slapped him, got mad, and his friends were like, what do you think you are? It can do anything to you and there's nothing you can do about it. So they held me and I struggled. I really struggled. They held me and dragged me to the, that forest on the other side. I kept struggling. I was like, God, no. Why? Then they took turns. The problem was not them, really. I kept seeing my dad over and over again. I kept seeing him, and it really hurt me so much. And I passed out, and when I woke up, I just found myself there alone. My clothes were torn. I got up. I crawled to the road. There's no one in sight because it was early in the morning. I knew where I was, but I couldn't go home like that. If the first caused my mom so much pain, I don't think she could take the second one. I just couldn't go home again. I was stained. I was dirty. I was unfit. So what did you do? <clears throat> I convinced myself I was okay. It was just a bad dream and I would wake up from it. The school's opened, I went back to school. We did our open exams, but I realized something was wrong. I had contracted an infection, a sexual disease. I had gonorrhea and candidiasis. I didn't know, but I knew something was wrong. Mm. And when did you discover you were pregnant? After three months, I discovered I was pregnant and they completely didn't want the baby. I didn't want the baby. I told the doctor, you know, I don't want this baby. Lavine arranged for an abortion but at the last minute could not go through with it. That decision cost her a lot. When the school realized I was pregnant, they couldn't keep me there in the school anymore. The principal told me, parents will start thinking that the school is encouraging to me just to get pregnant and continue their schooling instead of discouraging it. So they had to find me a place to live. Her mother refused to take her back home, but MCF opened its doors the only children's home that would take a pregnant teenager and provide the medical care she needed. Physically, I'm getting better. I'm okay physically. The only problem that I have, biggest, like the biggest challenge is the emotional, mm. the mental trauma. What has it meant to you to find yourself amongst girls and young women in the same situation as you? <laughs> it means a great deal because I realize I'm not alone. It's comforting to know someone has passed through the same thing. Someone else is feeling your pain. Knowing some people, other girls like me, seeing them with their kids, even if the circumstances are different, but they are having kids and they are teenage moms. It's giving me comfort knowing I'm not alone. And your beautiful baby girl is being looked after so you can have an education. Yeah. So what are your thoughts now about the future and the baby's future? I'm praying to God as I'm working. I'm praying to God that helps me through the future. Because, you know, I wanted to be a psychologist. I want to help people. Because my doctor helps me. Now let us talk about this. But see, we are told to Lavine is good at school. She is bright and will qualify for university. But the fees are beyond her reach. If there was a university as part of the Mali family education system, Lavine would be able to go to university to fulfill her dream of becoming a psychologist.
there is a race that I must run. There are victories to be won. Give me power, every heart to be true. <laughs> When the Mali children's family wanted to relocate to Delani, there was local opposition. The community wasn't too happy about a home they feared would be filled with thieves, beggars, and sick children. But the high school did go ahead, and when the school rankings came out for the district, the MCF school came in second place. Suddenly, the parents were trying desperately to get their children into this school. The high school seemed a big task, and it was, but it has been hugely successful. The vocational college that will become the Mali International University may seem an even more daunting task, but Charles Mali has no doubt that this university will attract students not only from across Kenya, but from the whole of Africa. The plan is that 30% of the places will be reserved for the MCF high school graduates who qualify academically. These places will be subsidized by the 70% of students who will be fee-paying students. Like all the MCF projects, the university needs the support of people like you, with God's heart for transformation. All they need is our help to get started. Once they have started, they can move towards becoming self-sustaining. Would you consider giving generously to be part of this big, bold, God-given dream? The proposed Mully International University will be an expansion of the vocational college already in operation. The project has land, a developed curriculum, and an international team of academic advisors. Living True's goal is to raise $750,000 for classrooms and laboratories. Today, you can invest in the Christian education of future African leaders. Put faith, hope, and love into action by sending a check to Living Truth, P.O. Box 91100, Bayview Village, Toronto, Ontario, M2K 2Y6 or call 1-888-269-6085 to donate with a credit card. On the internet, go to livingtruth.ca to make a secure donation. Living Truth is a registered charity and donations are tax deductible. And we prayed over this place, we committed before the Lord that uh, the dream that had been seen in the mind of Dr. Muli over 25 years ago was going to be seen here in terms of putting here an institution that is unique in nature and going to really change lives of many children who would come through MCF and other children also who will be able to come to this university. In the well-known story of David and Goliath, David trusts God to give him victory against Goliath because he has experienced victory through God at other times in his life. Charles concludes his message with an application for us all. Now, there are two things I want to just point out to you now in the last few minutes. The first thing is big things begin with little things. What was going on in David's heart became something big when he attacked the lion, the bear, the giant. And we will never experience the big things until we are experiencing the little things in our own life. When we obey God in the little thing in our life, when we pray to God about the little things in our life, when we trust God in the little things in our life, we will find God will begin to work in the big things. But you cannot go straight to the big things. That's why every soldier in the Israelite army was afraid of Goliath. They could not go to the big thing unless they had been to the little things of trusting God in their own personal life. What you will be when you grow up will be related to what you are now when you are young. I have in my pocket, it's in my hand now, a tree. 
In fact, I have in my pocket, in my hand, uh, some timber. I have in my hand a table and furniture. I have in my hand a whole house. What have I got in my hand? I have a little seed. Can you see it? Tiny little seed. And if this seed is put into the ground, it will germinate, put roots down. Soon after, it will become like this. But then it will grow into a seedling that will be planted in the field. And as the rain comes and the sun shines, it will grow and grow. And in 10 years' time, it will be timber. It will become furniture, a table and chairs. It will become a whole house that is built of wood. But today, it's just this tiny little, like a bean. But inside this seed is all the possibility and all the power to become the tree. You cannot just become a tree. We would like that. Oh, I want to be, do some big things. I want to be important, maybe. I want to accomplish a lot of things. But the kind of man you boys will become and the kind of woman that you girls will become depends on what is going on inside your heart now. And what goes in your heart now will begin to grow. Now when somebody becomes a Christian later in their life, God gets hold of them and he grows what he's begun there. But you have an opportunity many, many, many children across the world do not have to take Jesus into your life while you're young because you are hearing about him. I've talked to some of you in these last few days and one or two have talked about your past. And for some it was very hard. And one or two who I've spoken to said something like this, and then I got saved. They were rescued, their bodies, and brought here. But then God did something in my heart, and I got saved. And as one young man said to me, it says in the Bible, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, the old things have passed, the new things have come. I am evidence of that fact. So in the temptations that we face when we're young, and we go on facing temptations in our lives, in the fears that we have, in the anxiety, in the loneliness, we say, Lord Jesus Christ, come and live in that part of my life. Save me. Forgive me. Send your Holy Spirit to live inside of me so that I can begin to live a life that shows the presence of God and find the joy of God and the love of God. And you do that alone. David had to experience God alone. There's a moment when you, alone, kneel before God and say, God, I need you. Forgive me for my sin. You died to make that possible. And now come to live inside of me. And you'll find you'll have new strength, new power that you never had before. It'll be because God is in you and he is the one who is your power and your strength. We are only here at MCF for a few days, at Indalani for a few days. We will not forget you, but I wonder in 20 years, if we could follow every one of you with a camera, what would we find? Would we find women of God who may be nurturing their children to love and know God? Will we see men of God who are making a difference in the society of Kenya because you're living in dependence on God? He is in you because you live like a David. David went on to become the great king of Israel. And he was a great king because as a boy, he came into a relationship with God. He experienced the power of God with Goliath when he was a teenager. So he became a man who led the nation, and he led the nation well. He was a godly man, a man after God's heart. And every one of you here today can be a man of God in years to come, a woman of God. But it starts when we're young. This seed is tiny. Living inside it is a tree, timber, furniture, a house, but the seed has to be good. 
Your heart has to be right to grow and develop to be all that God wants you to be. This brings us to the end of our first program from Kenya, where we have witnessed faith, hope, and love demonstrated in the stories we have heard. You met Charles Mully and heard about his faith in God, his hope for the college and university at MCF, and his love for the children he rescues. We together now have an opportunity to participate in this exciting project to build the Mully International University which will impact Kenyan society for many years to come. We need your help. Please share in this vision, and please would you give generously. Do join us again next week as Hillary and I bring you more stories from the Mully Children's family in Kenya. Until then, goodbye, and may God bless you.